This is the Nietzsche Podcast. Okay, welcome everybody to Untimely Reflections. This has actually been a long time before, or since the last time we did an Untimely uh, Reflections on the channel. Uh, it's been a long time since I've had a conversation. And today we have the first ever guest on the Nietzsche Podcast. Mina, how's it going? Good, thanks for having me. And today we are going to uh, continue our tradition now of talking about some weird fiction for Halloween. I'm excited. Yeah, the, the Repairer of Reputations, which is the first short story in Robert Chambers' uh, collection, The King in Yellow. And I guess I'll give a brief introduction to the audience as far as what The King in Yellow is. Robert Chambers was a writer who was known for sort of sappy romantic stories. And a lot of those are actually still in The King in Yellow, mostly, I would say, the, the uh, I think I've brought it up to you in the past. I remember reading a, a review of Robert Chambers' King in Yellow, where they said, the, the first half are creepy, weird fiction stories, and the second half are creepy Victorian romances. <laughs> and they don't mean right. creepy in the sense of, like, the romance itself is creepy, but there's just, like, an air of kind of, like, uh, just the whole story, it kind of has a surreal or like morbid air to it. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that all the characters are these, or the most of the characters are these American painters who have gone over to Paris. France. <laughs> yeah. To, Bohemians. To, yeah. Um, and that's true yeah, of a lot of weird fiction, like uh, Arthur Machen, uh, who I'm also planning on doing an episode on, who wrote The Great God Pan. He had a... Uh, decadent streak as well, or he he wrote a lot about um, like he has a famous story about like a young artist who kind of like just burns themselves self out, like wastes their life, uh, you know, following their desires and things like of that nature. So there was kind of like a con connection there with weird fiction and like sort of like these story and characters and romances and the passions and all that. Why this short story collection is really famous is because it contains this. Story elements in multiple of the short stories, which is a play called The King in Yellow. And you can read the first two acts of the play, but anyone, or I think you can read the first act, but anyone who reads past yes. the second act uh, goes insane. And this is right. sort of like a known fact in this universe, in the King in Yellow expanded universe. And this is used in a variety of ways in different stories. Um, it's most central, I would say, to the fourth story, The Yellow Sign, and here, and the first and second story, um, but mainly here in The Repairer of Reputations, where we get a reality told to us by a narrator, and he tells us this sort of matter-of-factly. You know, uh, I'd, I'd recently read The King in Yellow, and everyone knows that reading past the second act makes you go insane, but obviously that I, I haven't gone insane. Uh, oh, and... he's, he actually he actually really knows what's going on, which in a certain sense, it got me thinking that a conspiracy theorist is like a low rent philosopher, right? It's like mm -hmm. the reason people don't take them seriously is because they're literally mad, right? And they're usually mad about their conspiracy theories. So it kind of makes, you know, it all there's all these little threads here. Um, and then even thinking to our story we read last year with Blind Owl, right that that was kind of like the real life account of you know what's fictionalized here the idea that there can be dangerous knowledge the idea that there can be that which the human mind shouldn't broach shouldn't know and then i guess in, within the co uh, context of individuals and cultures like so nietzsche says the individual it, uh, insanity is rare in the individual but for ages and peoples and cultures it's kind of the rule like there's something to all this right it's insiders and outsiders who's being accepted who's being rejected and why there's something also um in the gay science where nietzsche he i'm trying to think of exactly how he phrases it where he says that basically the difference between the madman and the sane man is not truth and certainty because both of them think they possess truth and certainty. It's that the same person has, they invest truth and they hold certainty in the beliefs that a law of agreement has uh, settled, that everyone has agreed to submit to within the society. Um, and that's, Ooh. it's very yeah. similar actually to like Foucault's whole approach in madness and civilization. 
situation. I've been talking a lot about madness on the podcast recently, so that's part of why uh, it, I was excited to talk about a story where madness is central for Halloween, because we've been just talking about so many of those elements, right? That, yes. um, you know, that basically the difference between the main character in this story and uh, everyone else is just that, that simply like, yeah, he has total certainty in the way that he perceives the world, but there are subtle hints throughout the story, sometimes not so subtle, that the way he, the world appears to him is nothing at all the way it appears to everyone else. And this even comes down to the way that he um, describes the setting, which is... Uh, America in the year 1920, which in this story is the future. This came out in the late 1890s. So right, and he wrote it in he wrote Repairer in 1895, and this was before you know fascism was a thing and all these things were a thing. Because I don't I don't know if you saw some of the writings on this uh, work, but like a lot of people post like post history, right? It having happened, they call the America that's being presented a, a fascist America, but that's only in retrospect because in 1895, I'm not even sure if that term had been coined yet in the political sense. My understanding, you know, cause I always take history and where and how it's recorded with a grain of salt, right? It's part of the madness. You know, uh, if he's sitting here describing this country where, oh, look, they shipped off the Jews. Oh, look, they shipped off the blacks. Who's left? Oh, look, they moved cars underground and above ground. Everything is soldiers uh, marching the streets. And it doesn't seem like there's much of any life happening above ground. Everyone's locked inside, actually. Or if it seems that way, at least. Like, I got, when he says something like, you know, they, there's mounted cavalry everywhere and there's no one around, like, but there's almost no one ever around except like in a few uh, cases. It kind of makes me think of a land where they've gotten rid of every, all the undesirable elements. They've run everyone out and any of them who are left, well, I guess the rest we'll, we'll get into with the story, especially with the lethal chamber. But I was just kind of thinking in that direction that post-historically it's framed as fascist. Historically, when he wrote it, fascism didn't yet exist however the author had like you said been over to europe in reality right um chambers spent time in france he heard the war drums over there he saw the anti-semitism he saw all these elements that kind of are just you know happen when a world goes to war so i think chambers as the artist was this like gets into McLuhan territory right for uh, people who like him or know him where he says the present or the future of the future is the present and that what do you call it that the artist sees the present you know basically where no one else does this almost goes back to that gay science quotation you just brought up right and so it's like what are we agreeing to see the artist sees what no one else sees and everyone else agrees to not see reality yeah. Well, it's also interesting because, yeah, he, he talks about America almost like it's become like an imperial style power. And, right, right. They're um, consolidating, right? And, and you mentioned the lethal chamber. I mean, that's one of the first scenes is where they're unveiling the lethal chamber. And they're presenting it as like a good thing that basically everyone will have the right to... Uh, I mean, it's like a suicide booth, like in Futurama, in the, in the first right. episode it, of Futurama. But it doesn't even cost doesn't even cost 25 cents though, right? So it speaks to how these people value life or what the profound statement was. If, if, if for all of eternity, we were concerned about you know the eternity of history, we were concerned about the immortal soul and saving the weak and pushing them on through pain and suffering, even if they don't want it. And now we turn around and say, yes, embrace death. It's, it, it, there's something to that, right? That speaks to the real psychology yeah, well, uh, and I just found the pa the uh, passage where they're unveiling it, and, uh, quote, Now the government has determined to establish a lethal chamber in every city, town, and village in the country. It remains to be seen <laughs> whether or not uh, that class of human creatures from whom desponding ranks new victims of self-destruction fall daily will accept the relief thus provided. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, we're providing relief to those who are dis so despondent that they wish to leave this world. And you can rest assured you'll, you will not have to suffer another day because we will basically allow you to cull yourself out of the population. And so I could see how that could be a, again, like with hindsight regarded as like almost a fascist type of sentiment because you're encouraging like the voluntary eugenic uh, self-harrowing of 
people like you're not looking at a depressed person as someone who needs to be helped but uh, like we're going to provide you relief by like a lot Allowing you euthanize yourself. I guess maybe the first question before we get into it, the way that the narrator describes 1920 America, my reading of the story is that, and what I've always kind of suspected in the back of my head is that it's actually not 1920, that it's actually the year of whenever this is published modern day, that this is part of the delusion of the main character having read The King in Yellow. He's like imagined an entire trajectory, what American society would look like. And that perhaps there aren't actually, you know, perhaps America hasn't become this imperial power. That doesn't mean that uh, there aren't actually soldiers. There couldn't actually be like a military parade going on or something. Well, his cousin, but this gets back to, I guess, sanity being what, what reality are we agreeing to? Because if we can both see it, it's technically real. If I'm seeing something different, all of a sudden we have a problem. And this actually goes with what you said about uh, philosophers earlier, that the philosopher invents problems. And almost like the artist, everyone goes, why? Stop it. We have it all figured out yet. And it's like, but aha, you look, look at this here, right? So it actually, where you, you kind of got me thinking was how Nietzsche talks about Pascal, for instance, and says that he'll never forgive what Christianity had done to Pascal, and then Pascal talks about philosophy and says, let us not forget that Plato and all these serious philosophers, they were just men of their time, having fun. The least thing they took seriously was philosophy, and philosophy is politics, right? They're, they're inseparable in that regard. So it's like, at what point, what are, what are we, how are we supposed to take philosophy and politics anyway? Are we supposed to be serious? Are we supposed to be ironic? Are we supposed to be cynical? Are we supposed to be mad? Oh, is that a question? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> do I don't. I, I'm saying like the whole of it, 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 it seems to be a laughing stock, I guess is kind of what I'm getting at, is that it's this long running joke that goes back to the beginning of civilization. And I'm thinking of Plato kind of writing in the in the golden or the fading golden twilight of his civilization's day. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, it's kind of like here Chambers is doing the same thing. You know, they're kind of all these philosophers and thinkers who kind of do cleanups for their ages. You know, they kind of condense it all in a way saying, hey, this is what all these people think. This is what I see. It's almost like an alternative history, you know, going back to this story. So why this is relevant, because if this guy sees a dynasty and then he thinks this like he's so delusional and he is self-centered that he's willing to kill his own family to be sure that he inherits the dynasty it shows you how like thorough and pervasive the madness of a culture is because like there's this other line from Nietzsche I think it's um it's human all to human where he says basically the generalized modern man of the world um like he just he thinks he is more important than the entire world itself mm -hmm. and this is what a crazy person looks like to me they will they will throw they will destroy reality before they agree to reality or accept someone else's reality. It starts going in that direction. <laughs> you know, uh, it's funny you say that because I never thought about this story in that light of uh, like Plato. Like there is because, okay, so you mentioned a story element that one of the main character and we should we should say his name was uh, Hildred. Uh, yeah, Hildred Castain. Yeah. Who believes that he is set to uh, like, like, as you say, uh, the imperial dynasty of America, that uh, he can become the the heir of the last king of the imperial dynasty right, of America. Right, because the repair and, of reputations did the genealogy, right? Right, yeah, and he, he goes to a man named Mr. Wilde, who, um, from what Hildred tells us, like, he's basically the guy, man, in the modern age of, like, cancellation, how nice would it be to have a, a repairer of reputations, right? But like, oh. imagine he's like a fixer, um, and he presents him as like this guy who has connections everywhere, and that he can basically change, he can repair your reputation if it's been ruined. But when we like get the actual details of what Mister Wilde's like insignificant grubby apartment looks like, and the fact that like uh, he's in, he's like at war with his cat, basically that, that he's always like the cat yes. and him are always like getting into fight, like. He really strikes us as being another crazy person in some ways, um, like another person who's delusional. I, I guess what I'm saying is like, so the whole delusion, right, of like, I am 
Um, and and I, I, I should clarify, this is an unreliable unre- narrator, so we don't know to what extent even we can separate delusion from reality. Sort of implies that the whole way that he is presum- potentially hallucinating about what 1920 America is actually like might be his platonic ideal of what society should be. That the idealization of society that he quite literally perceives around him and thinks is real is a reflection of the delusion in him reveals some inner desire with him. It's a very clever way to do it, to basically do, to even within the framing of the story, you have an unreliable narrator who's potentially hallucinating this future as a kind of like platonic ideal, reflective of his own inner state and his own in, inner oh, like workings. Right. So then question for you, if he thinks he's the ruler, then what does the average member think? Like, okay, let me ask you this, uh, another way to frame it, and a rhetorical question, because I know you're not a fascist, but like, what do, does, is this what, the, does the individual fascist who's part of the larger group think this? Because obviously the fascist group is saying we're the meaning of the earth. We are the the one and only, right? Like that's the condensation of power. So isn't this kind of how they think? Isn't this how the individual ego thinks? Which again sounds I, insane to me. And then if I look, but if I look at American politics of the last few years, I'm thinking of people screaming. I'm thinking of people screaming in the streets. People arguing the most plebeian thing. You know, like the uh, conspiracy theorists. It's hard not to see the American voter like uh, they have their own uh, corkboard and you know yarn that they're sitting there connecting pegs to in line with this. Uh, media that's you know affecting their minds so yeah where does it all come together or where does it all come apart i guess might be another way to put it well don't i mean doesn't anyone with like a political vision kind of do this like isn't even somebody who's a (laughs) far left marxist anarchist or a libertarian version they have some sort of fantasy that out in their minds of how the ideal society would work and they probably imagine themselves existing in that society and there's jokes and memes about this uh, the famous one is the guy saying oh i thought i was going to be a uh, you know a, a street an online game streamer for the for the cause in the new marxist utopia and they say no your job is to dig ditches right it is it is kind of the interesting thing about the story though is like if this is all true this or if this is like a justified reading of the text then it would basically be that like there he uh, that uh Castain, Hildred Castain's already like living in his platonic ideal. Like that is the nature of his madness. And that would almost point to something else, oh, which shit, is kind of the Matrix, right? Right, but but that's like the kind of person who looks around. I mean, the Matrix is actually a great example because you you're like looking around and saying, Man, what a wonderful it would be like the first Matrix. The first Matrix we made right. was like perfect. It was like a paradise on Earth. Well, well now but now that we're here, so you brought up the main character lives as if he's already in his ideal world. It seems like the na- what idealism is by definition is this world and these people aren't good enough. So we're going to start to pretend like we're going in another direction. We're going to start pretending like we can change or fix this. So back to why Socrates is such bad taste in ancient uh, Greece. He's sitting there go imagining changing this. And, you know, all his interlopers are looking around going, what do you mean changing reality? How could you do that? How would you do that? It's the initial rejection of changing anything. And then over time, my understanding is people in Western philosophy take it seriously. Political people take it seriously. Philosopher professors have long been teaching the seriousness of Plato, you know, along with the irony and the jokes. But that, like this was some grand vision to do something, and it seems to me it was already done. You uh, know, and then expand they, on that. What do you what do you mean like, by okay, it was already done? Okay, so so if the first matrix was fine. Uh, it turns out that the matrix was fine. Reality is what it was, but it, the people living in it couldn't handle it. So it fell apart and died, right? There, there was, you know, civilization number one, and then civilization two comes along. And their version of the matrix is a town by a forest, and then they use up all the wood to build their town and their fuel. And then before long, there's nothing left. So that civilization two fails. Then they move by the sea and civilization three takes off. And then a big wave comes along and washes it away. So it's this constantly changing. And there's everything about what we did wrong in the past is supposedly going to get fixed in the future as we live in the present. So there's this idea of like, when are we ever in reality? When are we ever, you know, in the present? 
there's actually, to me, there's no reconciling it because it's all a, a thin rope over an abyss and that abyss rests over death. Yeah, I mean, well, it's interesting because in some sense, like the Nietzschean position is that it's very difficult to like get it across in like a sentence, but that, you know, right, there's the reality there's, is yeah. chain. The reality is change and transformation. And so right. but, you, you're not proceeding to anywhere or coming from anywhere. And so that kind of changes what is meant when you talk change, progress, transformation, right? Um, because the whole idea of like Whig history is the idea that there's like some sort of... Um, yeah, or, or like Whig history might actually be a bad example, like a Hegelian end of history, again, Fukuyama, or, or fascism, frankly is that there's like some sort of state that we need to reach and we're like proceeding towards that. But if there's no state that you're trying to reach, um, that changes the nature of what that progress or change is. And it is, I mean, yeah, there's an element in all fantasies about how things ought to be that is about establishing what the end state is to be. Okay, what does the ideal republic look like? And, you know, it's just funny when people try to blame Plato for, like, fascism oh, right. or communism or whatever, when it's like, not everyone who has, you know, come up with a utopia has needed Plato. Um, that's just, right. that's just the voice of human dissatisfaction with reality. And the, I don't know, the, the nature of mankind to make war with reality that we find dissatisfying through our idealism and our fantasies. And then, yeah, the, the interesting thing about uh, this story again is that it's not expressed as idealism it's just a mad reality that he's living in right so if we go back to should you want to from here i guess we go uh, it's good uh, good exploration i think of some of these ideas but if we go back to the beginning of the story right he's saying toward the end of the year 1920 the government uh, co had completed the program, right? So they, they've, uh, like, it's like he's saying they've reached their stasis. Now society is just about perfect and we're going to keep it this way. And this is, to my mind, this is what the book of culture is. The book of culture is how do we, how do we make this and how do we maintain this? And then the, the reality of flux says, you know, good luck. You can never step in the same river twice. Yeah. It's funny also in that opening, uh, paragraph where he says, uh, everywhere good architecture was replacing bad. And even in New yeah, York, I love that. a sudden craving for decency had swept away a great portion of uh, the existing horrors. Um, yeah, it's like there is a, huh, there's an aesthetic, there's a moral, there's like a political program that he, that Castaigne imagines that society has proceeded towards. Again, as I read this, I, I think it's still 1895 and that he is basically he has hallucinated this entire development of because well so to get into it uh oh he's, he's a little more of the plot details it. um where he says that he he, he had a, a horse accident similar to Nietzsche fell off a horse but he unlike Nietzsche had a head injury resulting from this and he had to spend oh, some time line. recovering it oh what what was that when he says, he says, to the contrary of what my doctor said, the fall off my horse improved my character. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it didn't drive me insane. It was actually an improvement on my personality. So already like that denial of reality, already that you can't look at it. So you basically look at the opposite, it seems. Like there's, uh, there's only so much the human eye can see, I guess, is what I'm saying there. Yeah, I think, um, well, I mean, the other thing, too, is that he says during his convalescence, while he was recovering in the hospital, basically, from this injury, that's when he picked up the king in yellow and read the play, presumably the whole thing. So there's already a question, I guess, sexual source of his madness is. Like, is it the head injury or is it the play? So what's interesting is if you take that in context, this is the first tale in The King in Yellow. If you take it in context with every other story, the king in yellow seems to be like a real phenomenon that drives people insane. But given that this is the yes. first story that we read, we don't have any of that context, you would be justified from just like what's self-contained in the first story, thinking that the king in yellow, like the whole idea that that's what drove him insane could, could be another delusion almost if we didn't have that other context. But that does, right. it, it does, it is kind of leaves you to wonder like, what is the connection there? Like, so he has a head injury at like, which seems to be like a reasonable explanation for why somebody would have a personality change. 
strange have a descent into madness or, or like some sort of neurological condition right but then he winds up like, in the hospital right but then there's this other thing in the background which is the king in yellow i guess we should talk about the king in yellow i mean the play the content of the play i mean we know there's a couple characters named casilda and camilla and we know there's a stranger who's wearing a mask and that we know in act two it drives you insane but we don't really know much about what the play is about so that kind of I would I would ask you like what do you think it represents or if anything. Okay. Okay, I think well, here's here's where it gets everything's kind of I think come home here in the sense that you know, the king in yellow in at least this first story, the only other person who confirms it is Mr. Wild. And then we have the question, okay, do does two crazy people equal the cognition of a sane person? You know, no. or does to, to do, you know, I the French call it folly ado, right? So, so you have Mr. Wild and you have was it that Hild- Hildred, right? Yeah, and so they both believe in it. They both kind of understand it as this long lineage, and I sort of see it as like I don't want to say the spirit of tyranny, or you know, because it's not. It's almost like I see the king in yellow as decadent eros trying to keep itself together almost right this 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 militaristic world at war filled with these kind of characters you know this is the result so oh and speaking of mr wild uh well i don't want to get ahead of ourselves here because i guess we should uh follow since we got back to the beginning kind of follow it linearly um well um, yeah but but that's interesting you say decadent eros it's like the characters who are attracted to reading the play or like the circles in which this play is circulating are these decadent painters or these decadent right. it's American not, figures. It's not for other people, but here's where, okay, I found an interpretation online. I had never thought of this and I don't like it in so far as it starts to be like, oh, the whole thing was a dream or the whole thing was a joke, right? This is more real. This is more interesting. It's like, oh, the whole thing is insanity or sanity, right? But I found an interpretation online, credit to um, Reddit user uh, Tony Fool, but he posits that the whole thing is a misunderstanding, that people lose their mind because they think what uh, is being described in the fictional King in Yellow, right, the, the book that's supposed to drive you crazy, is that basically they read this play as if it's reality. So the example he gives is like when they – when he – when the line says, there fly the tatters of the king. He means, he says, okay, that's stage direction for the curtain, the yellow curtains to close. When they see the moon, uh, you know, the weird imagery of the moon behind the lake, that's because the props hanging in the background and the, the shadows kind of off or wrong. Yet they get lost in their own mystical interpretation of it. Oh, here, yeah, yeah let, me, let me hear it. I'll read his exact lines because I brought it up here. If, just uh, to get the main point across uh, of what he's saying, he says, my theory is that one of the reasons it is insanity inducing when read like a novel is that it was never meant to be read like that. It's intended to be performed. And so the descriptions in the books that are mind bending outside the context of the theater would make much more sense as read as stage directions and prop production. And then this is where I go. My understanding of Plato is he went to Athens to perform the Republic with a troop of mimes. So back to the question of how seriously are we supposed to take philosophy? And, you know, uh, (laughs) I I guess seriously enough that we might lose our minds and, you know, turn to the state. I don't. (laughs) Well, well, Plato, I mean, you know, he wanted to write as beautifully as all the poets and playwrights, and he wanted his philosophy to have the same power. And there's this resentment in Socrates and Plato of the power of these irrational artists to, like, bend people's reality. Um, which right. is what the Dionysia does, the, the, what the theater does. So um, I actually fully believe way, Plato would want that kind of power. What, yeah, what? Right, no, no, I, I think you're, no, you're right. This is, this is the, the psychological element of uh, Nietzsche's interpretation that leaves most people, I think the first time you, anyone encounters it, a Westerner who was raised with this stuff, right, they, they look at that and they just go, what is he even talking about? Like, you can't even fathom it at first because it's so... I don't know, baked in. It's so invisible. Yeah, well, and so that's like an interesting interpretation that I would almost say, I, I would almost want to take it like, stretch the interpretation a little further that maybe it's not literally that the play 
drives people insane when it's read as a novel, but that Chambers is saying something about the fact. Imagine the feeling of insanity. So there's a Twilight Zone episode about this. It's called, um, God, I don't recall the name of the episode at the moment, but it's basically, um, you know, a, a man wakes up in his house and he goes to the office and then like suddenly somebody yells cut and he realizes that he is on the set of a uh, film and that he's being filmed like the office that he's in isn't real. It's a set. And he's like, what are you talking about? I really am this character. The implication would be that he's a mentally ill film star who the scenes that we saw as the audience at the beginning of the episode where he thinks it's his real life are his delusion. But from his perspective that we follow as the audience, right? He thinks that the fact that he's on a film set is a delusion. And, uh, you know, if you want to go watch that episode, I'll, I won't spoil how it ends, basically. Uh, there's like a, there's a, there's a twist at the end, but it's actually not a good twist. It's one of my least favorite Twilight Zone twists. But I really like the idea of, basically, this is kind of what I was thinking of when you were talking about uh, that interpretation of The King in Yellow, is I was thinking about being an actor in a stage play who doesn't know you're an actor in a stage play and then noticing things like, Oh, the lighting's off. Like that's not a real moon hanging there back there. You know, like that's part of the set. And, <laughs> right. and then how, and so I wonder if chambers was trying to imply something like that, that that's kind of what the experience of madness would be like, that it would be as like a, a similar experience to thinking that you're the character in the film story and then looking around and around you uh and like being suddenly hit with that knowledge uh, you would i mean and then like everyone around you again has submitted to this law of agreement about what's going on and they're all telling you you're not really this person but you know you're that person you have the memories of that person like what a strange experience that would be um it, like is that the alienation of madness is that what chambers is getting at by like suggesting people are like reading this play as a novel when really it's actually a play, right? Like they forgot right. that it was actually a play and they're taking right. it for and reality. It, and there's elements of that because if the Apollinean vision is just as unreal as the Dionysian, because I would say what people say of the Dionysian is it's not real, right? Change doesn't happen. And now with where we're at in history, history doesn't happen anymore either, right? Because it's all figured out. Everyone knows what's what. You know, I would say it sounds like when I hear political people talk, I just go like, oh, there's someone who knows everything usually, right? It, you, it often, or, you know, if you've come across people who can only ever be right, like those are crazy people too, right? They can never right. say like, and it, I also get that in a harsh world where you got to watch your own six, you know, that it makes sense to me that people are like that, right? They're defending their vulnerabilities. They're defending themselves because technically there's no protection for the mind. So maybe again, where it's platonic is, hey, if, if these people are, are in a cave, we better tell, you know, then here's a noble lie. You come out of the earth. Here's the story. Don't pay any minds to the fake clouds. Don't look at the fake moon. Don't look at the yellow curtains. Right. And then yeah. we kind of like, you brought it up with they live, right? You put on the glasses and then you go on your nihilistic spree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it is. It is like the whole they live metaphor of this. It would be like if somebody, again, just I'm putting myself in the position of like, imagine you just saw the world the way that the main character uh, who's not named and they live like the way he sees the world, but he knows that he put on the glasses, right? That's why he's not insane because he's like, oh, this isn't, this is like a piece of technology that's allowing me to see the world like this, right? But if you just actually, I mean, then, then there are, there are like schizophrenics out there who legitimately will see, like, oh, that's not a police officer, that's a demon. That's not a library, you know, like, and what would that do to your, like, yeah, like the alienation that Foucault talks about, the alienation of right. madness, um, the sovereignty right. of unreason, where it's basically like, in spite of anything else that like other people say, according to like what's empirically factual, you still know what your perception of reality is, and you kind of can't get away from that. So it doesn't really matter. And just like how terrifying and alienating that would be to be like, I am just legitimately not perceiving the same reality you are. Right, and then and then how different is the artist's 
from the average person. <laughs> right? We're going to school. I'm going to go perform. Okay, you're crazy. <laughs> Then it does seem like the message is, I'll show you, you know, which, by the way, the character echoes many times in this book. He's like, I'll get you, Dr. Archer. I'll get you, uh, cousin, you know? Yeah. And I yeah. guess this, the, the mad genius comes to mind, the archetype of the mad villain. Well, he says, what, what does he say at the end where he's like, don't try any of your doctor's tricks on me. Stop acting as though you think I'm insane. <laughs> and so, but that's like, that's, that's also an amazing line for getting into like the experience of insanity because it's like, I don't even believe that you believe I'm insane. Right. You're playing the game like you have to. You're just doing what you have to do because you would treat me this way if you saw me in my position and I'm aware of that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, there's these weird hard lines in perception. And then I go with different people and different types of people like personality type, like what is it, what is really given to anyone to see or know, you know, culture winds up being like the shorthand that we share to say, Hey, this is real. This is not Coke or Pepsi. You got your choice. Um, but don't, you know, don't go getting third and fourth and fifth types. Cause those aren't real. Right. Yeah. Well, so I guess we should probably talk about, I guess, what happens in the story. I mean, it's actually, yeah, it's it's actually fairly straightforward. I mean, he goes to, yes. he, he has his cousin who is an officer in the military who's going to marry Constance, the daughter of the, uh, the daughter of the armorer, I almost said daughter. Um, and basically, because he's seen Mr. Wilde, this repairer of reputations, who runs this vast network, this vast conspiracy where he can sort of alter your reputation, your public standing. You know, you know how he does um, it, right? Yeah, he I, says I like you're saw... blackmail and bribes and yes, it's just, he's a blackmailer is what he is. And I just found this out too, this last read, his ears are missing. It's like an old punishment, right? From back in the day where uh, certain types of scam artists or thieves would have their ears cut off. So everything in the fact that he's missing his fingers on his left hand, again, probably some punishment from the old country, England, right? Where they would have chopped off your fingers. And so what they're showing you or what he's, he's telling you is like, this guy is clearly a con man and they're basically being nice by calling him crazy, right? Or about, you, you know, whether you call him a con man or crazy, it's same difference to polite society. It's someone who doesn't belong. Well, I was going to say, I, I, I called him crazy because I, like, I, I, I get that impression that he actually believes that he runs this network of like blackmailers and things like that. But actually, by you raising that, that is a thought that has occurred to me in the past, is that it might be, again, we're getting it from uh, Hildred's perspective. People. Right. But, but we're only getting it from Hildred's perspective. I mean, it might be that this dude is completely just a cynical con artist who's realized I can take advantage of this crazy, crazy. person, Hildred Well, Vance, Stain. too. Remember, Van, Van, uh, not, I guess to get ahead of ourselves again, I'll go ahead and throw it out there, that uh, one of his assassins is a crazy man named Vance, who by the end of the story runs into the chamber. So what you can see is that these guys have influence on the people in their world. It's just to what degree and what kind of people are influenced by who and what it seems. So the idea that, okay, Halbert can agree, like, like with his uh, with Hildred's cousin Lewis, that Wilde's a bad man, and everyone can see and know that. But meanwhile, Vance, uh, Mr. Wilde, and Hildred, they think they're doing a they're they're doing a thing, right? They're doing something very specific. Um, and then, okay, and let me bring this element up: the fact that for however much doubt we can cast on Mr. Wilde, he clearly does know things because he even tells. Um, Hildred to tell Hauberk where to find a missing armor piece, right? Because Hauberk's an armorer and it's worth a lot of money. And sure enough, Hauberk follows the lead, right? And now what's that say about Hauberk, right? Because he's a sane man listening to a criminal and a crazy man. But sure enough, he does. And he finds out the man was right. Turns out Mr. Wilde did have correct information and it led Hauberk to make a small fortune. Right. Well, <laughs> but that's sort of, okay. So that's the other thing though, is like, did that even happen or did Hildred imagine, imagine that, that happened? Yeah. Imagine that Hallberg said that I personally don't know. I mean, that's the thing. That's actually what I like about the story because, and maybe to just take a couple steps back, 
So what I said at the beginning is like the way I read the story is that it might not even be 1920. Um, Right. I should be clear. I'm not trying to reduce the story to like, oh, none of this really happened and it was all a dream, like you were saying. And I wouldn't just say like, which, you know, I wouldn't say like, oh, obviously, Hallberg didn't actually say that. I think the interesting thing about the story is that you know, like to a large degree, um, maybe not when you first read the story, but upon rereading, you're like, okay, to a large degree, reality is being misrepresented to me. Um, oh, yeah. But you don't know how. And so that scene with Halberk is one of the most mysterious scenes in, in the whole short story because it basically, yeah, it implies that Mr. Wilde actually does know things. And Halberk's reaction to Hildred bringing that up is sort of like, how do you know about this? Like, what? It, wait, like, he he doesn't react the way. Um, uh, people react to Hildred at later points in the novel where the, from their dialogue, he reports it very clearly. Like, Oh, right. It's the scene changes. like at the, at the end where he's, he's talking about like, well, that's the yellow sign. Oh, is that what it looks like? Um, and that's the kind of response that a doctor would give when they're not trying to say, what the hell are you talking about? Are you insane? Cause you don't say that. Uh, you play along but he's clearly playing along with something that is not readily obvious or apparent to him in the same way, right? Oh, yeah. Can I? Like, I, I can't hear He's this humoring right him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is where, right. And that's where Hildred gets mad when he can perceive he's being humored because he takes every, like, at the end of the day, he's a very serious character and he's on a serious mission. So it goes, uh, he goes, it's the yellow sign. I said angrily, oh, that's it, is it, said Lewis, in that flattering voice, which Dr. Archer used to employ with me, and would probably have employed again, had I not settled this affair for him. I kept my rage down and answered as steadily as possible. Listen, you have engaged your word. And he goes, I'm listening, old chap, he replied soothingly. I began to speak very calmly. (laughs) And he calms down a bit. Dr. Archer, right, and he goes on with his plans of having, I think, Archer assassinated. Or he's recapping something, whatever it is at that moment. But yeah, that's where you see the divergence is that for him telling a what is otherwise a serious and coherent story, it's when other people begin to enter into his reality that his whole tone changes and he starts getting mad at the people. Right. Yeah, no, exactly that. So that's that's the one indication that everything with Hallberg and the rare piece of armor actually happened. Because like why would he falsely report that interaction as a narrator, but then right. truthfully report the other ones? And so you don't, we don't really know what's going on there. And that's probably the most interesting part of the story is that like, so for example, um, again, with the question of like, why has he lost his mind? Is it because he has a head injury or is it because he read a play that drives you insane? Well, in real life, reading a play doesn't drive you insane. Um, <laughs> but it right. is funny. It is funny that the book that we looked at last year, The Blind Owl, that is uh, like the whole, if you read any preface to that work, they'll tell you in Iran, they basically treated this book like it was the king in yellow. They did, um, right. And uh, what are some other examples? I mean, like there were, there's been a couple of assassins who have had copies of Catcher in the Rye. And I remember right. well, even that, even that story... Nietzsche. That 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 very uh, subpar existentialist story, uh, Catcher in the Rye, had an air of like <laughs> danger about it, um, because of that, right? Sorry, what right, were you right. Saying? Oh no, that that that's exactly it. It's the whole hey, like we have our platonic ideals. What do we start doing when everyone start when when individuals and groups start moving away from that? Right? Who's who's the sane one? Who's the insane one? And then in terms of, I think most people think in terms of practical reality and like taking this back to the Hallberg example where like Hallberg wanted to be clear of the debt. Like remember he's sitting there, Hallberg seemed distressed by the fact that Mr. Wilde was right. He's sitting there trying to discharge the debt saying, hey, I really should pay you. I should pay him or whatever it was, at least a finder's fee. It seems like he's almost trying to like uh, puritanically or superstitiously like ward off this thing uh in that instant like there's a different tone that's affected there that you don't hear in the yeah it's scenes. terrifying it's terrifying to Hallberg because he's like whoa right <laughs> am i crazy wait 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 a minute 
you know? Yeah, because like, that's a moment where Hildred's with uh, Hauberk, as well as his daughter, as well as Lewis. And then I guess with his political fantasy is that, so it seems like, to me, it seems taking his word for it to a degree and saying, hey, Lewis confirms that all those battleships are out there, right? He's naming them all. And you can hear them shooting their cannons. The other sane characters can see and hear this stuff, right? And then they're all together. And then, but in his head, he sees this as a larger dynasty, right? Hildred does because he got the information from Mr. Wild and he believes it. And he's somehow taking part in this. And Mr. Wild, again, the only other, one of the other characters in, in this story that gives credence to the King in Yellow is some sort of real entity or real power um, of which the Imperial Dynasty has a lineage in even. And which, then, is, which is incredibly strange because that's a figure from the play. Right. So that's where that's where Wild kind of intersects between like you could read him as just manipulating Hildred. But if he actually like believes this, it's also would seem to be like a manifestly insane belief because like why oh, would okay. why would the the king of the American dynasty be descended <laughs> from like the stars of like, the high Hyades or whatever? Like it's almost like a sci fi, like supernatural sort of I... like entity that we're saying like we're tracing the lineage of America to. Like it's like saying like the king of Britain's descended from Nyar Lathotep from an H. P. Lovecraft <laughs> story. Right, like, I think you know, those are like stories. What were from what? The Hyades and what do you call it? Haster, a lot of these terms and ideas Chambers got from Ambrose Bierce. He took a few of the elements and a few of the places. Even even Carcosa comes from a beer story. So it's all like it all does follow a uh, American uh, a certain American and Western lineage of artistic. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That that the the weird fiction authors have no compunction about like their ideas and their their place names and character names and entity names, <laughs> thing names, are like uh, blues standards or jazz standards. They're like, yeah, yeah, kind of. Go, go <laughs> ahead, like, yeah, Cthulhu is like the house of the rising sun. Do your version of it. Like yep, it's fine. Then, <laughs> make a left at make a left at Carcosa and you're there, right? Like, right. Uh, so, yeah. and there there was something in particular about this. I th I might have lost the thread. My bad. Um, do you want to uh, pick us back up uh, earlier in the story because uh, we're kind of or yeah, back I guess and forth here. Yeah, we're doing back but, and forth. Uh, maybe I, I could even like edit in like a little thing where we explain it. I don't know. We'll we'll see how it goes with editing. It's cool. Yeah, but it's like. Um, yeah, the the well, the main conflict in the story, I guess, would just be that that uh, the main character feels that, or he's told that if he's to inherit this dynasty, his cousin can't marry the woman that he is uh, suiting after. Or is, okay, what well, we, we this is political, so we need to talk why, right? Because politics are real, right? It's like almost the only thing that is real in the real world, let's say. Um, so, in a certain sense. He, the reason why is because with the genealogy is that he's a duke, Hauberk's a duke in exile, which makes his daughter a duchess, right? And she, what was it? Uh, the Duchess of Avon, Avonshire. So Avonshire, as far as I can tell, is a made up term. But if I'm not mistaken, a Avalon was on the Isle of Avon, or is it vice versa? Uh, let me see if I, did, I, did I write it down here? Okay, that... So in the genealogy, so Lewis is his first, like he precedes him in bloodline, right? So therefore, if she, a duchess of Avonshire marries him, he's now the rightful king, right? And then, you know, cause he's the first king. So this is why Hildred wants to, wants to wind up assassinating him is cause he realizes if he marries this duchess, you know, my claim to power is gone. The right. line, oh, here's the funny thing. This is how it's perceived from the outside world. My legitimacy is gone. Whoa. <laughs> what do you mean legitimacy, sir? Everyone thinks you're crazy. <laughs> right. Well, and there's something about this. Hmm. There's something about this that uh, I'm, I'm trying to, like, find the words here. It, it comes through in so many stories in the popular consciousness. This idea, I mean, it's it's right there in Star Wars, right? Uh, but but this is like a trope. It, it's usually a fantasy trope, but Star Wars is fantasy in space. So like Luke Skywalker isn't just like some guy. He has a genealogy. Like you, you might be a insignificant person in an insignificant social role, 
But like, you know, that's why there's so many of these characters and fantasy novels or whatever that are like orphans or they're raised by their uncle because it turns out you're descended of the true king, right? Aragorn right. has to take his throne because of a genealogy. It's not because he has any skill of leadership that he's like developed in his life. He spent his whole life like basically like wandering the woods. Right, <laughs> like right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um like I think in the book the detail they give is like the the innkeeper like like Aragorn will come in and a song for his dinner basically as like to beg for his supper. Um, not really begging, but like, cause he's like, you know, that's a thing people would pay for, I guess. But, like um, and then, the, yeah. And then that guy would, uh, you know, go on to become like the king of all mankind. Right. Uh, not because of anything he did, but because like you have something special about you that is genealogical. That's just like in you. And so that kind of belief, like there's a, there's a real logic to insanity drawing on that kind of belief belief and i wouldn't even say that this is like a a source of individual pathologies so much as like a, maybe a cultural pathology that yes how many people significance. yeah how many people think that about themselves um that well deep <laughs> down <special>. i'm special <laughs> yeah i'm special but here again the genealogical element and i, I guess i wonder what you would think about this that also plays into the whole idea of, I mean, whether it's a delusion or not, what the way he perceives 1920 America as, a, as an imperial dynasty and the fact that he's the heir to that dynasty. Um, like, I is guess what I'm saying story? is... <laughs> Isn't that what they tell well, us? That we're yeah, special that, well, that's his, and his... we were born of the earth and we freed, we freed the people of the world. And I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to be extra facetious. I'm just giving for non-Americans, I'm giving them the, like when you're born in America, you know, you're told how great it is. You pledge allegiance to the flag or you, you know, burn the flag. It's like, it, it's the same inverse, <laughs> right? It's, it's, right, right, it's right. again, it's Coke, you have Coke or Pepsi, but either way, Coke and Pepsi both together make up the ultimate nation. Like that's kind of the thing, right? Uh, so I can't, yeah, that cultural conditioning to bolster the ego, to create it to be strong enough to withstand the slings and arrows of the world and to do its duty therein, but to not, because like you go too far either way and it's pathological. One is like just decay, right? Because you're not, you would say that's giving up on life. And the other to fully assert yourself, that's to put forward conflict, right? There's like this continuum right. of activity that people are going to perceive as for or against and it's like for or against anything right them their culture their way of life and then to me i just look at it and go man who who does it belong to anyway and i guess maybe i'm reminded i know you i haven't listened to this one yet and I, I want to uh, but i know you did um young's undiscovered self and i know that what young writes in there is talking about like him and his friend walking along and i think it was new york city and his friend points out yeah you see all these hundreds and thousands of people walking around every single one of them is the center of their world and every single one of them wants to live forever and mm -hmm. so like taking a country like america what if it is something like hundreds of millions of people who think they're the true heir of the american dynasty because isn't but like in some sense isn't that what a culture is supposed to tell you like that's the noble lie of it to be like yeah come do your duty you know just don't get too far out of line well i think there's something i'm trying to I'm trying to think of like how to how to phrase it. It's like there is something that is particularly appealing, though. Like, because we're, we're we are, we are talking about it like in terms of like specialness, but there's something yes. particularly appealing about like genealogical specialness because it has oh, nothing proof. to do. Well, it, yeah, it is. Pr well, it's like it's like incredibly proof concrete. <laughs> it's incredibly concrete, and it's like a part of you, but it's also through no effort of your own. It's like oh right yeah, right like, no it's it's also saying it would say if the genius knew what was best for them they would shut up and get over themselves too really uh right because just like the other just like the the poor person born okay mr wild has genital uh some sort not genital but uh congenital defects right so it's like hey he he didn't choose to be like that's just how he entered into the world right just like uh someone who's genius or insane would too right like they didn't have a say in it um and then i think the moralizing of the platonic ideals is the idea that 
punishment, regulation, enforcement, like this gets into Foucauldian territory, right? That like there's a reason and a logic behind all that and everywhere in it is hidden a morality. Everything you're told is that it's to help, it's to fix, but in reality, it's punishing. It's, um, hmm. what's the word? Uh, corporeal. Right, it's because you're punishing the brutalizing. body. Yeah. Yeah. As uh, Foucault describes it. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I guess what I'm just like the straw I'm grasping at from earlier is like I'm thinking of the people who like the kind of person who reads Nietzsche and is like, "Oh, like that's me. I'm an elite. I'm an aristocrat." But like the reality is that like they work right. at McDonald's or whatever. And so like what okay, how do you deal with that <laughs> that Right, but how do you de- this- like but how do you deal with that cognitive dissonance right you say like well genealogically like i'm special right um and it might not be like literally like i'm the king of america secretly but that like you see this like yeah you mentioned like the fascists earlier a lot of them have this idea of like we're the chosen people um or like we're the the superior people and it's just like in our blood right and I'm like destined or owed great things. And the, yeah, like, as you say, (laughs) it's almost like entitled. Sure. Yeah. 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 But I think for a lot of people, it's really, you know, that might not even translate to behavior that's entitled behavior in their, their ordinary lives. It's just sort of like, that's how they square the circle of like the conviction that I'm like, I am special, but also every manifest fact in my life shows that I'm not. And, you know, that's a hard pill to swallow for most people because, I mean, you've brought up a lot about America. Like, yeah, there is like this sort of like exceptionalism in America. Um, and, you know, th- it's very does it, though, Right. Like every culture sure. is supposed to do it. Like they have their words for valuation. They have their goods and bads. And then they tell their stories about themselves. And then they reinforce those stories about themselves. And it's part of their power. It's inseparable from their power. It's part of their language too. Right. So it's like the it's, it's the scale and the weights of the scale. And then everything they judge is placed there on, right? It's just, there's only a question of, is it, is it in or out? Is it a part of, does it live or die? Like there's only so many options you have, right? Um, yeah. But I, I know, I know, I know exactly in terms of this, this receding image or this straw that doesn't want to be grasped. I, I know what you're talking about. There's a, it's here a few places. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, like you could say it's almost like what the whole story is about in a way of like, yes. um, I mean, to put it like in a ge- really general terms, like, yeah, the, the coping mechanism, the way that you will literally rewrite reality so that you are the main character, even when like a, an objective understanding, any objective reading of the situation will be, you're not the main character. And that you could say that that's like a kind of madness we all have, right? But the interesting thing about the story, again, is that there is a distinction between the main character and everyone else, because they do seem to be living in a different reality than he is. He has read The King in Yellow when they haven't. And, um, you know, there's another element in this that The King in Yellow is like a banned book that you're not allowed to have. And we kind of touched on this earlier a little bit. And that's like kind of, I feel like the conventional interpretation of The King in Yellow is that it does just represent sort of, I mean, I think something you said earlier, like, um, it's just the idea that like of pursuing the truth or whatever it might be, seeking knowledge that actually drives you crazy, right? Um, And to that extent, I mean, kind of, I I guess I'm trying to constellate almost everything we've already talked about, um, about like the broad themes. It's like, okay, I'm this insignificant person in the world, right? If like, just starting from the ground up, um, I'm this insignificant person in the world. And like, I read this play that gives me the knowledge of that, that I'm just an actor in the story, so to speak, to kind of throw on the theater, you know, and that's what drives you insane. And prompts the reaction, the excessive reaction of literally rewriting reality so you are the main character in the story. And that's like, that's kind of how I, I don't know, would interpret no, 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 no. There's something... the Yellow King in this story specifically. 
Well, I think I think you're onto something here because this gets to the birth of tragedy, right? Like the idea that one, like comedy is funny because it's about types, right? It's about generic man, so you laugh at his pain, you laugh at his misunderstanding. If that was you in that situation, you'd be feeling the pain, you'd be dealing with the awkward misunderstanding. So comedy is about types. It's about the objectification of people. Tragedy is about the personalization and personification of a person, right? That this one person, for whatever reason, usually royalty right they matter they matter mm. their suffering matters their pain matters it's put to the point that it was put on center stage why else you know this was like i think some of the original misunderstandings about greek art in the larger like the idea okay this gets even to the idea of the play and what we talked about it's getting meta on the meta i think or real from the meta is that something like that the people watching don't know what they're watching the people performing don't know exactly what they're performing but they're left to play it out anyway regardless of whether or not they understand what they're doing right like that idea that the world and i guess it's shakespearean right he kind of was talking about it too the world's a stage all of its people are players of varieties so when Nietzsche says something like the Greeks weren't even aware of what they did, it's like, I can't help but think that ties directly to the theater. And that was to under understanding the, um, the line between comedy, the line that leads to and from comedy and tragedy. Uh, maybe it's a circle, right? Cause that he also idea says of... they're a nation of actors, the whole, right. this whole nation of actors and, um, the numerous, numerous comments that the Greeks are superficial. Like, that they're the kind of people who can actually see... I mean, this is, like, the kind of thing you can take it or leave it, right? Is this actually true? Sure. But it's Nietzsche's interpretation is they're the kind of people who can actually see a masked actor portraying Dionysus and be like, that's really Dionysus. Because that's how he appears to me right now. That's the reality, right? They're superficial out of profundity. Whatever appears to you is real. And, right. you know, that's actually a very funny thing to consider in light of madness. And it's... it's it's funny that that's very rarely the objection that I hear from people. This is a bit of a digression from King and Yellow, but just just no, uh, humor, humor me for a second. Um, oftentimes, when you're kind of talking about Nietzschean critiques of epistemology, perspectivism, basically, um, and, you know, the emancipation of appearance, that, like, we're going to invest the reality in the world as it appears, rather than looking for the reality behind the appearance, so to speak. Oftentimes, the people who have like an issue with this do not raise what to me is the most obvious objection, which is like, okay, what about clinically insane people who are very clearly experiencing an appearance which all of us agree is not what's happening, right? So aren't they, isn't that like proof of the reality behind the appearance? Because there's an agreed upon reality that we're all seeing them that they're not. And I think the reason why people don't raise that objection is because it points to like the fallibility of the senses in a way. And the fact that the only way that we can really establish what's quote unquote real is by consensus, which is not actually usually what the people who critique Nietzsche want. That's not the can of worms they want to open. They want us to just say the senses are real, right? Or like, like not real. You know what I mean? Like, Basically, yeah, like, what, they've, what they've inferred is truth. They've already, they kind of like they already have the truth, right? Is that right? Is that right? Sure. I mean, like, which is also saying the appearance is real, but they want to be like, but no, it corresponds to like a being behind the appearance, which is like substance or something, which to me just sounds like, you know, the Zen masters called it piling delusion on top of delusion. Um, to me, I'm like, that's yeah, right, just, right. that's just what I said with extra steps. Right. Um, it's it's the Platonism of Platonism, like before long right. we're turtles all the way down. Um Right. Or it's it's really it's Aristotelian where they're you know, they're we're not doing the Platonic form thing anymore, but Aristotle's like, but things have a substance, like they have a being that's not oh, just a yeah. mere appearance, right? That's like the mere appearance is real. Um something like that. It corresponds to reality. It's the correspondence theory of truth, right? Um so anyway, I guess just to circle back, I guess what I'm saying is like, um, Madness is probably one of the most interesting things to think of in light of that, because, you know, if you go well, to a, like a Dionysian, like, stops, right? it starts where comedy is... stops. 
What do you right, mean? Because tra- tra- well, because with tragedy, we I de- we were empathizing, we're sympathizing with the hero, right? It's not about pity. It's just a, it's understanding their pain and their loss. Let's say, and, and then possibly experiencing it as such, um, and then. Right. And then why, you know, it, it's so that whole thing is kind of contrary to um, kind of any everyday society where you go around and no one's crying in public. Like that's never been like that's not really a thing that people do or are supposed to do, at least in our culture, let's say, as an example. But here we have a relegate a place relegated where you can do it. It's in the theater. It's with art. It's in the therapist's office. But so so if you take it seriously, it's tragedy. When you, the more you dehumanize a person, like a person slipping on a banana peel, let's say, right, it's funny. But then if you, that was your friend and your friend got seriously hurt slipping on the ban- banana peel, you laugh until you go, ha ha, oh, wait, he's got a concussion. Oh, shit, this is serious. You know, so that idea that, hey, we can kind of dehumanize each other with humor. But the moment someone doesn't think it's funny, they literally get mad. <laughs> the mm-hmm. ego, right? The ego saying, yeah. hey, I I take an offense at this. So to me, it seems like the central nexus is this is um is the just an ego maniacal being, period. And that the whole premise of a larger culture and society is to keep all these other egos in check. And then it doesn't matter whether it's true or false, sane or insane. It's just, is it real or not? But real or not is determined by consensus. And if insanity is generally the rule of ages and populations. Right. You well, know, yeah, you're I guess left we haven't in a really funny talked predicament. About that. Well, or like what Jung says, where, you know, like he, he's like, I would estimate that like 40 percent of the populate population are like latent psychopaths. Oh, right, right. They, not they, not that. Need to pop up. Right. Yeah. It's like they only need like they only right. need to see that behavior yeah. modeled by the legitimate psychopaths and then they'll start imitating it. It's also very Girardian in that way, maybe like we just need, you know, um, <laughs> to go back to the, well, the Joker, I, I like, you know, everyone, everyone's got a madness within them. They just need a little push is kind of what Jung says in a way. Um, sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess speaking of people, okay, well then take every, take every anarchist, every political actor in the world who's ever done something isn't isn't that why they wanted to be seen right like hey look at me or even think of did you see the guy remember the guy who burnt himself outside the trump like he was they showed him in the news to not show him right they said here he is look at this crazy guy lighting himself on fire in front of the trump's court session in new york here he is clearly he's unwell okay clearly he's dead but that's it that's all you need to know but you know yeah well and actually his point was like uh seemed nonpartisan to me uh, like his whole manifesto or whatever. There was also that guy who bur- bur- in the army who burned himself over the Palestine issue. Um, right. And yeah, there were like multiple self immolations, and people are really uncomfortable with self immolation because it's oh, very it's- hard. It's very hard to be like, oh, what a bitch. It's like, uh, would you do? Would you do something like that? You know, like they're kind of like stand in judgment of you because, right. um, you know, you would never have the balls. To burn yourself alive right and uh i certainly right. wouldn't i wouldn't do it but um doing that to get a manifesto published i mean or or read by a lot of people you know like that's a move um right but and yeah then, like but then sorry but then saying i tend to think well wouldn't, don't the same people look at that and go like who would read that except crazy people and i can see the reality i see is that i know and that's it this is what unwell people do they self immolate the, oh this is so good though because like but then we go back to uh what's his name uh <laughs> the guy who burned himself in vietnam who's on the cover right, of the, the rage monk. against the machine album right right like if you look at how he's like considered or just regarded in society people will be like most people don't even know what that was over they think it was like a protest the vietnam war which it actually was not it was a protest against the south vietnamese government that had taken an anti-buddhist stance because the current rulers were catholic i believe and we basically were propping them up because we didn't really care uh so long as they were pro-american and anti uh viet cong Right. And then like they basically the wife of the current president was like really big into cracking down on Buddhism and they they nicknamed her the dragon lady. Anyway, most people, even though they don't know any of that context, will be like, what a heroic act. Right. Because he's like a Buddhist monk, which in I think the modern Western liberal mind is equals good. 
and right. Vietnam War equals bad. And yeah, there you go. Like it's kind of so again, ostensibly an insane act, but there are people who will be like, "Wow, what an amazing sacrifice!" Or they'll treat it as like, "Wow, that's complicated," right? Whereas, um, if it's someone who is vehemently pro-Israel, they'll look at Aaron Bushnell, who burned himself for Palestine, and be like, "What a crazy loser," right? right. And it's purely just based on like, it's not the act itself. It has nothing to do with how crazy you think the act itself is it has to do with like whether you agree with their view of the world or like whether what the consensus around you agrees that their view of the world was correct right because people who don't know anything about the burning monk will be like yeah well he seems to be considered like a heroic resistor right right you know? well it's exactly why rage you know what will their name rage against the machine right and that they have put him on the front um, and I guess maybe he's a little bit more sane though, cause he did it calmly. Right. And that's the difference. Like, it seems yeah. like with the Americans, they're screaming and going, you know, yelling. It's like, had they sat, I wonder if had they sat there in, you know, perfect Lotus pose, right. Would they be received differently or would they be on the next album cover? Um, but instead <laughs> I mean, it was, I, I'd be impressed by the perfect Lotus pose because I don't know about you, but I cannot get into a perfect Lotus. <laughs> I never have been able to in my whole life. Yeah, but you're like 20 <laughs> feet tall. Oh, listeners, Keegan's like 20, 20, 27 feet, not 30 feet tall. <laughs> right, that's true. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. Look, Vikings weren't supposed to get in the lotus pose. It's just, it's not in their blood. <laughs> they were supposed, yeah, they were supposed to take mushrooms and be berserkers, not, uh, not like meditate. Yeah, it's not for us really. Oh, right. Um, hey, I know we're 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 letting it uh, fall apart here, which is fine. Uh, we could bring it back to <laughs> the story. We're we know that we're in America. There's more to it. There's more to it. You know, I guess going back to okay. So what's the difference? Um, if I guess have we legalized um, euthanasia yet amongst people? I know it's uh, prevalent more pre uh, prevalent in the West. Like over in Europe, it's legal a few places. Canada. Has it, yeah, has it been legalized in the U.S. yet? I don't think so. I mean, there, there was that guy. I remember there was a lot of talk when I was a kid about Dr. Jack Kevorkian, I think was his name, uh, who was like a super pro euthanasia doctor, who I think illegally operated and uh, like uh, not operated like surgically, like operated like his euthanasia thing services right in america but i don't think it's really legal i it's funny that you bring this up too because i guess it is an integral part of the story the fact that they have this lethal chamber which i thought would i mean really the only place where it plays into the narrative is at the very end as you mentioned before right, um the the third crazy person in right the, in the, the assassin yeah right who couldn't, couldn't who, go who might just it. be a crazy homeless guy for all we know right with a knife you know, like assassin can mean a lot of things like. Right. And then we've seen a bunch in recent years. And the idea that you look at who these people are and it's like, who are they? Most of the times it's like, uh, OK, there's 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 a, a notion that they're nobody. But like the character in the story, isn't that the madness and the serious of it, uh, uh, seriousness of it? It's like, I'll show the world I'm not a nobody. Look, if I do this thing, I'll be not famous, but I'll be infamous forever. So there does seem like there's this component of the human psyche that absolutely seems to love in being a monument to destruction and death or has no qualms about it. There's a, a Sartre story called Herostratus, which is about that. And that's named for the person who like, like I think it was the Parthenon or the Acropolis, some ancient Greek temple that was burned down and nobody remembered the name of the architect who designed it, but they remembered the name of the guy who burned it down. And basically the main character <laughs> of the story, that's that's his inspiration, and it's his inspiration to attempt a mass shooting. And it's actually a very disappointing mass shooting where he doesn't he, he doesn't measure up even in that. It's like, you know it's one of those stories that's kind of funny in that in that way, where it's like it's like somebody failing to kill themselves and then, you know, someone coming along and saying, Damn, you can't even do that right. Uh, like right. it's a real, you know, like he, he, he's like, I'm, I'm finally going to do something destructive, meaninglessly destructive so that my name lives forever. And then he kind of like shoots a couple people and then and gets arrested. And it's not even, it's not the blaze of glory he imagined. Right. 
but oh, um man <laughs> yeah it's it's like it's like what a tragedy right <laughs> but um <laughs> right yes or sorry i wanted to address the euthanasia thing really quick though um because like people ending themselves like you said or like i guess we're talking about ending other people even among like uh people because there's like more and more people who are like neo-pagans now um even among that group, I got into a discussion the other day with somebody who was like saying euthanasia was like disgusting and like immoral. And I'm like, okay, like I'm not going to argue with you, but what's your actual objection to this? Cause I understand it from like the Christian angle, but like, if you're a neo-pagan, like, what are you saying? Like, shouldn't people, I mean, I think it was Schopenhauer who said like the one right sovereign right that everyone should have is the right to end their own existence. Um, now Schopenhauer was against suicide. He thought it was wrong. But he didn't think the state should stop you, right? Like, he was, he basically thought, like, how can you take away that right from somebody? But then you think about the, the idea of, like, facilitating it. And, like, what does that say? Like, to encourage people to actually, like, take their own lives. And so, like, that seems to be the problem that most people have with it. And I guess, I oh, don't know. Yeah. Like, it, it, it kind of, it raises the issue, or the question of, like, what role the lethal chamber plays in the story. Because as I mentioned before, it's teased at the beginning. We see it get used at the end, but it doesn't really play like the story is not about the lethal chamber. It kind of just like looms over the whole thing. Right. And I don't know what, maybe like, what are your thoughts on kind of what it I'm represents? Thinking, all right. So here's, let's see, I marked this part in the story. Now that the government has determined to establish a lethal chamber, right? Where he's saying it in every town. Um, he was this is the president's giving a speech right at the commencement at the opening of it. Um, there is a painless death awaits him who can no longer bear the sorrows of this life. Did you read this earlier? Um, uh, not that death, part, but yeah, that's a great that's a great line, right? And he goes on, If death is welcome, let him seek it there. Then, quickly turning to the military aid of the president's household, he said, I declare the lethal chamber open. So the, there's a painless see so so it's almost like because in front of the lethal chamber is the fates right so that the right. fates are gu guarding the fates uh, are there at the doorway to suicide and I'm wondering if it's supposed to be a larger cultural you know because him is an artist him is a bohemian him is someone seeing the present which is in his time he heard the drums of war right because i think he is describing um a you know all these mobilizations that were happening in reality you know the turn of the century back then uh you know either nations coming home from war or getting ready to war uh go to war and then i guess in his case he would have seen kind of the the climate leading up to World War One, but maybe there's something too that all this idealism leads to confusion, leads to insanity, leads to suicide. And then, or, maybe yeah, there's... I guess it's yeah, it's like the, huh? It's like those are your two options: invent this fantasy where you're the king. <laughs> like, well, I mean, like if we take the story as if the main character. Like, I'm trying not to put it so vulgarly, but that it's like a cope, sure. that it's like a fantastical cope, right? That, like, it's either you cope with this fantasy or suicide is what awaits you. We need art so that we don't perish of the truth, I think, is what Nietzsche said. So, <laughs> right. um, that's kind of how, how, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, well, and it's funny too because, uh, comedy was always considered the plebeian or the lower class form of theater and tragedies for the elite. I mean, you mentioned it earlier. It's usually like, you know, a, 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 a king or something is like the, the figure of tragedy. Right, so by how could the populace identify with the king. Sure. Well, you're right. And, and it's like by Hildred, Hildred like is like placing himself in a tragic story um, because these kinds of, Machiavellian power struggles to secure the throne and have to assassinate your family members and stuff like that is the stuff of tragedy. Um, and of course, he's not, you know, he feels as if he his rights have not been honored, has his legitimacy has not been honored, right? So he's he uh, he's positioning himself as a tragic figure almost as a way to like elevate himself out of the ridiculous, absurd comedy of just being another type, like. 
because of this whole time right. you've been saying crazy. So that's like a type that you put on someone like oh, he's a crazy person, right? Right. Um, it's right. another way that you're not extraordinary. That's another way that you're just like oh wanna... right right. It's a way of arguably like just like ordinary is a, a word of containment. I'd say crazy is a word of containment. It's like it's almost from a logocentric point of view to me. It see it all seems super superstitious. The idea that hey here's a phenomenon I don't actually understand, but if I put a label on it, I'm containing it like it's a magic spell. <laughs> yeah. No, but I if agree, we all I agree, agree, but again, if we all agree to that this magic word is real, <laughs> right? Then then we're sane and they're crazy. And then you know, I know, and they because look, sane. In my experience, sane people get mad when you try to explore insanity. Like, there's a reason, Fu, uh, Fu, like Foucault, maybe, maybe. See, he would have stigma anyway, right? Because he was gay, he had AIDS, he had all these other things. But yeah, like, and he imagine, was also insane. I mean, like he, he literally is insane. Well, I mean, he 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 har he had problems with self harm and suicidal thoughts his whole life. Um, right, but but did was that right? But was that see? I guess this is where his like why what interested him was personal. Like it seems like most everything that interests us is is personal to us. So it's like maybe in his per, it does seem like okay okay if people are uh, against the craziness, it's like. Because maybe he identifies it with more than not, or that he saw his life as on that continuum between this normal world where I don't belong and this crazy world that doesn't even exist. Hmm. So it winds up being yeah. kind of tragic, right? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, like, the degree to which he could be called, like, clinically insane, maybe I, I, I don't, maybe I'm going too far. I'm kind of like doubting or like hesitating in what I just said. I guess I would just look at it like if somebody is having like insane might be the wrong word, but if somebody is just like, I literally can't stop from like cutting myself, which is something you would do, you know? Um, right. But if that, you were to kill yourself racing cars or mountain climbing, people would be like, Oh, that's a fun hobby. Too bad they died or that was kind right. of dumb or they should have been safer. But yet that people risk their lives on a date. I mean, our lives are on the line every day, whether we want to acknowledge or not, right? That's kind of the uh, the maddening thing of it all, right? That we're constantly pushing death to the background. We're constantly pushing unpleasant facts of existence to the background. Yeah, I mean, I, this is like kind of gets into the Freudian death drive, right? But like, yeah, you could say that actually a lot of those hobbies or or, or behaviors are actually self destructive in their way. Oh, right, and, and Young um, might Young might agree and say that you didn't look at your dreams or you're unconscious enough to discover what your dreams are trying to warn you about. Um, yeah, do you remember that one story where Jung talks about uh, he has a friend who who would go mountain climbing all the time, and uh, his friend started having a dream that he was like. Uh, like on the side of a mountain climbing it and then he would like leap off and fly yep, yep, yes. and 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 Jung told told him he's like you need to stop climbing mountains because you were going to have an accident and you're going to fall to your death and that's exactly what happened to him um and he's like of course he didn't listen to me <laughs> right like he didn't listen to what his dream was telling him but it's like i don't know i, I don't have an explanation <laughs> for that it's obviously an anecdote it's not like a statistical reality it's just something right, that but like if you experience. if you drive a car you might drive the like hey i'm having an, a, a dream where uh, i had a car accident well that could or couldn't happen in real life right <laughs> you know so sure I yeah i like it, well it gets weird interpreting it when you're like do you, does the dream actually have like a predictive power or is it like is it just a warning from your subconscious so Okay, that, like, here's what I'm Because there's that, think. I think it's McLuhan actually who said, he's like, everyone experiences more than he understands, but it's experience and not understanding that influences behavior. So translation, you might be doing something that like, you don't know is super dangerous, but your body knows it, if that makes sense. Like, your body right. has blocked oh, the experience right. that like, you came really close to dying just now, even if consciously you've pushed that off. And right, so right. Oh. in where is that going to come to you is in dreams. And if you so ignore right, that, it's a, profound, it's a profound feeling to have a near death experience. Um, so the way the body, I know the way the body feels that is easily, I don't want to say traumatic, right? Because I'm not trying to associate it with all the associations there. But I mean, it's just it's a rush, let's say. So or it, it can be when you realize how close you were to something really bad. Um, yeah, go on. I I, th I think it was a good point. Oh no, that that was that was that was all. <laughs> Basically, right. right. So, so I'm I'm thinking maybe this guy. It wasn't that. It wasn't the obvious of oh, you hang around a barber shop, you're gonna get your hair cut. It was 
there was something about this guy's mannerisms. Maybe there's more to, maybe there's things that Young was, couldn't even recall consciously in the sense that maybe Young was intuitively picking up on certain patterns like this guy's behavior that was kind of relaying that he had been getting careless or he'd been getting lazy in his rock climb or in his mountain climbing to where he was getting too risky with it or he was getting too bold with it. I, you know, there's many ways I could put it. Um, but then that's the thing to attempt anything dangerous is bold sure yeah well and it, it is like we, well you raised it earlier this this is one of those points that i know that people who are like generally opposed to like whatever you would call postmodernism don't like points like this but it is kind of like okay where do you draw the line between legitimate <laughs> insanity and like uh, just like a pastime when it comes to dangerous hobbies right like and that i'm actually asking like I Right, I don't actually right. because like, yeah, there like many things. There's like one side where I'm like, that's sane, like clearly. And there's another side where it's like, yeah, somebody just enjoys mountain climbing or skydiving. I'm not going to say that they're insane. But then there, there are certain behaviors where you're like, okay, you're pushing it. And like, how acceptable is it to push it? And why is it that we say like skydiving isn't insane? Because technically it is kind of right. If you right. think about like just the way I did it, I did it once. I did it once. Yeah, my my <laughs> wife loves it, and and I, it would never because I'm like, well, the jumping out of the plane is what you do when the plane's crashing, and you absolutely have to jump out of the plane, right? <laughs> and I, and right, well, people, right, but the body, the body knows, being, like though. they the train for the nose. Right, because flying up there, you're just going like, oh, I'm way high off the ground in a perfectly good airplane, right, that joke, you're in a perfectly good airplane, and then as you have the time as you're flying in the, in the air to realize that you're about to jump out of this thing, which is clearly the dumbest thing in the world, <laughs> right. You know? right, in a very real sense, to anyone sane who wants to live, you know, like, why did we come this far to just to commit suicide? And it's like, well, that seemed to be the point of it. It's just, it's squander. It's fun. Like, have fun with it. Don't right, be mad. Right. You know, but like, that's, but so, so that's the thing. So, 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 so we're getting, man, we've kind of gotten off repair of reputations, but we're getting to something really interesting here that I, I want your opinion on. Cause yes, that's, you could say that that's, that is, that's like, that's life. We're squandering. We're having a good time. That's all art. That's all entertainment. That's all like basically the things that people say are the meaning of life or not the meaning, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I work I a job so that I can then squander my time doing things that are fun. And almost all of these fun things, even if they're not dangerous, it is like technically like it's like a waste or it's just excessive. And if we're just thinking about that strictly rationally, like the way a Vulcan would think about it, you would say that's insane. Right, like nothing would be worth the time. You would you would eliminate art. You would banish the poets. Right. You'd become extremely mathematical. You'd be extremely linear. You'd basically rule out one t entire entire hemisphere of the brain in favor of the other, and call that what life is supposed to be. I think, because again, right. from the Vulcan perspective, art is unnecessary because it's a way. It's it, theoretically it's a waste. Um, helping like maybe even helping people becomes. A waste you know so many things just become a waste because none of it's like again where do you draw lines where do you reconcile them where do you when there's so many remainders when the math that you know for being such a mathematically proficient culture it's like a, at the end of the day a lot of those figures never add up um, yeah yeah well i mean yeah i guess i'm just wondering like in in ordinary life like oh how do we justify then what we do call insane in terms of you know, like you see somebody doing something on the side of the road that makes absolutely no sense and seems like a waste of time. Like they're like, oh, I'm here counting the bricks on this building. Right. Oh, okay. and, well, I, and, and you would say like, well, you. that's crazy. OK, yeah. What's right. the story? This is a simple, stupid story. It was camping out in the desert uh, with some friends a few, a few years ago, and I had a beer bottle in my hand and it happened to be a little bit of a windy night and the wind kept picking up. And I started hearing this hot, like this slight low howling humming sound. And I'm thinking, you know, immediately, you know, this is external stimuli, right? It's not coming from me. So where's it coming from? So I start looking around and I, I notice my friends start watching me and I'm, I'm watching him watching me, right? This is, this is where I think this kind of stuff comes home. And I'm looking for the source of this sound and I can't hear it. And finally, like I get up, I walk around a little bit, the campfire, that kind of thing. And then I finally pick up my beer bottle and start tilting it a little bit and leaning into it. 
and I'm just as I'm realizing the sound is coming from the wind hitting my beer bottle to make this weird hum. Like just as I'm listening to my beer bottle, like it's talking to me, I look up at my friend and he's looking at me with a concerned look on his face, <laughs> just <laughs> going, what the fuck are you doing? Right. And that's exactly it. Like you see, like you said, you see someone counting bricks on a building and maybe on one side of the spectrum, you say, Oh, this person's neurodivergent and they're like counting matchsticks like rain man. Or then maybe, you think like you realize like oh this person's an architect and what they're doing is appreciating things you can't see sure no that could so all be true but then there's also people who that's like, what i think it is there are no lines then there are no well, lines well, well, just... yeah but but then what about but well, then what about the reality that sometimes and like i'm gonna be honest here like so i've done a lot of touring with my band and that yes. takes me to the downtown part of a lot of cities oh, and shit, the people bad, and in it? the downtown part of a lot of cities there are crazy people that wander around and we typically call them homeless people or hobos, but they I think even here. homeless homeless is a weird way to talk about them because it's not like they just don't have a home. Like I'm trying to think of how to put this. It's no, like, it, right. it frames it as if it's like an economic issue that they were like, and that's what there's a push to be like, we should call them houseless because it's not like, you know, that's part of the language game of like soft, continually right. softening it's language and you're then, not supposed to see it's right a thing it's another thing you're not supposed but, to see but it's like really the reason why they're on the street for most of them is is a combination of drug addiction mental illness and loss of family it's like those three things right and if they, you have they one person right if you have like only one or two of those two things you probably don't end up homeless um but mainly the drug addiction and the and the insanity, and then when you don't have family to take care of you or nobody who cares about you, um, right? You know, it's not like they just couldn't pay the bills, but they were working a nine to five job. It's usually that again they have some issue. So so <laughs> I think there's a, this is all this is all like a long long way winded way of me saying like I've actually spent more time than most people encounter having random encounters with with people who are like mentally not on the same wavelength as me to put it politely. And right. I guess I'm just going to raise the possibility. Like there is a possibility that they're an architect or that they're a neurodivergent or whatever. You can use the ball. There okay. are some people, but there are some people who will literally be there counting the bricks because they actually like, they think if I don't do this, like Xenu is going to eat my brain or something like that. Like, well, that's, just, that's just Scientology. No, yeah, yeah. I just I, I, I reached for the first alien name I could think, and it ended up being from a from a legitimate, right. very real religion. But um, come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. Well, I think with most of us, we this is where we look at and we go, oh, this person's clean. They ha they they're wearing clean clothes. They're not wearing three weeks of dirt on them, right? Like this is where appearance becomes reality, where. The, the actions are subject to interpretation, but at least the person looks somewhat sane or like they're not going to harass you or hurt you. Like they look hard. Maybe, maybe sanity, uh, sanity starts to be, or insanity becomes harm and self-harm. But then I'm, mm -hmm. then I'm looking at this and I'm wondering, like, is the whole is the premise in this story that what they're really trying to do is to encourage everyone who technically doesn't belong within a narrow bounds to just die? Is that actually the message of this story? Like, there's actually a very narrow. Well, realm that of might be normal. But well, that's why that's why. OK, that's why unreliable narrator, narrators are so interesting, though, because that might be the point of Hildred's story that he wants to convey to us. But that doesn't mean that's what Chambers is trying to convey. Right. Like, right, right, right. actually, from you saying that, actually, I'm like, that might actually be Hildred's point, like, uh, oh, which is when like he, when he's king, everyone's probably going to die. Oh, well, the fact that he's already well, it's political, right? It's Machiavellian. He's already he's already ready to get, assassinate his cousin and Hauberk and Constance. Right. That's Hauberk's daughter. Um, like he's willing to act against his own family to seize power. Right for a gene, he's willing to act against his living family be, to to stake his genealogical claim on his own specialness, which is also very interesting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, well, that's that's fascinating because it's like, again, like so setting like maybe the like the the fascist associations aside, 
um, although it is interesting to consider them in light of this, it's like, yeah, the kind of world that he presents to us is one in which, like, the detritus of society should just die. And the great people in society should rise to the top. And, of course, what's insane about it is that he thinks I should be at the top of this hierarchy. And all of you, like, my cousin, who seems to be, like, in Hauberk and Constance, who seem to be, like, sane, reasonable people, right? right. They're, they're the ones who are going to get chewed up and destroyed. Right. Yeah, they're, very tolerant. About as, yeah, they, they, they actually, you can, they're concerned. And I guess, you know, this is where... If you want, if it, depending on how cynical you'd want to be, you'd concern, you'd question the legitimacy of their concern. But I just take it like normal people that generally you take people as sincere. You take them at their word, right? You kind of, if you actually want to see who and what is there and why, you don't project all over them and then say you understand them, right? I, I mean, most people. Like, do that anyway but yeah no I right, right 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 so <laughs> so in this case in this case the first projection as well is he a danger like 5150 right danger to yourself danger to others that might be their immediate concern but like the fact that they want to spend time with them and that they do like a lot of like you know how it is with um uh, insane or deranged people like most of those people you actually can't spend time with them because it's too dangerous it's too unpleasant it's too um it's like you can't I'm reminded of that scene in Fear and Loathing when a uh, dude took too much acid is in the bathtub and keeps having outbursts and Hunter S. Thompson realizes he can't go to sleep with this guy in there on a lot of drugs because he might wait, you know, he's like, you can learn to uh, deal with something like uh, your dead grandma crawling up your leg with a knife in her teeth, but you can't turn your backs you're back on someone like living under the effects of a potent drug that is showing him similar experiences. Yeah, I, I, another scene, I mean, uh, an interesting thing about Fear and Loathing is that there are quite a few scenes where, uh, from our perspective, from Hunter's perspective, reality, like, looks insane, and, and he's even acting insanely. But yes. people around him are, like, reacting to him like it's normal. It's like the inverse. he's of, in Vegas. Um, <laughs> right. Well, and I, I also took that as, like, so particularly because it's a drug movie, but it's also about altering perception, right? So yes. uh, there are, you too. can very, it's like, it's like the, it's, yeah, that's true. It's very, um, i trying to think of how to say this. It's a very common experience when people are on drugs uh, to think everyone knows when they don't. And I kind of feel like <laughs> mm. his own behavior is even he thinks it's crazier than it actually seems to the people around him. Like when he's checking into the hotel, right? Uh, and like the, the oh. patterns on the carpet are like twining around each other and moving. And like the way he's interacting with the lady, you'd think she would be like, what's wrong with you? But it may, it just makes me wonder. I'm like, is he even actually talking that crazy or does he, is he, is he paranoid that he's talking that crazy? If that makes sense. Right. Oh, no, no. And he's sick. Cause I remember there's that part he's sitting at the bar and he questions himself too, where he's like, rr, 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 rr. he's kind of muttering. But I think the question he formulates is, did I just say that out loud? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, he's, he's literally sitting there uh, questioning his own reality. And hell, I can even remember a time in um English class in like high school where I had one of those moments of shit, did I say that out loud? Or <laughs> like, I, I hope I didn't, <laughs> you know, like yeah. it, it's, it's maybe it's a, a slip of the tongue, a slip of the mind. Either way, um, you're kind of caught in that position. Um, yeah, I, I just had a random story because we were thinking, talking about this, and uh, um, just the other day, uh, last month when we were playing a show uh, in downtown Austin, uh, you know, this lady walks up presumably homeless and she asked me for a cigarette and she has like a uh, a half eaten chicken drumstick in her hand that she's like kind of working on i guess and so i was like oh, sure all right here's a cigarette and she's like thank you and i can see on her fingers she's getting like the chicken grease on the paper of the cigarette uh which was kind of like i'm like staring at it and kind of having a minor like uh not panic attack but like I sympathetic like disgust. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> but then she, and then she, she, what does she do next? She extends her other hand forward with the half eaten chicken drumstick towards basically being like, do you want, do you want to take a couple bites of my drumstick? You know? No. Right. Uh, so obviously I did. No, uh, no, uh, uh, obviously I was like, no, thank you. But I, it made me wonder where I was like, man, 
there seems to be like a pattern with a lot of these types of people where I've interacted with them where they'll like do things like that where they're like um they'll like I don't know like offer you something like their food or something like that. I mean, I can't really think of another example where I almost like get the impression I'm like are you just like kind of like daring me to do that? Like you know that most people are going to be like uh and you're just trying to like shock me or like oh, like no. I don't know what like have something up on me like that like uh you know, I don't know. Like, well, what are you scared? You know, like that kind of thing. Like, is this like a dare type deal? No, I think I, I have a, I have a speculation. Uh, if you want to hear it, um, yeah, I'm I'm wondering if similar to how I was talking earlier, words being like magic words of containment. I think there's something about projecting onto others the idea that hey, like you know, you meet someone and you go, okay, here's a person I would I would love to hang out with. Right. You know that. And then here's a person I'd love to go on a road trip with. Here's a person I could never go on a road trip with. Right. You could you could classify these sorts of like notions in, in any number of way. But I can't help but wonder, like when, when people meet like that is if and I don't well, I mean, this with all due respect. I'm wondering if she's thinking like this guy's more like me than not. We'll take the chicken. Like, I don't know. Were you wearing a band shirt? <laughs> like, I'm wondering if or like, you know, were you were you yeah. looking like a, like a like a heavy metal player? Yeah. Yeah. So and maybe... I, I had a cut on. So like right. you know, I'm like I'm wearing okay. like a leather jacket or a, or a denim jacket with patches and like yeah. Like... So so I'm thinking she's just thinking like, hey, this guy's actually closer to me than the guy in the like. She 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 might have asked the guy in a business suit for change or a cigarette, but maybe she wouldn't have offered him the chicken. But we'd have to run that experiment. <laughs> right, right, right. See, you know, it's funny because maybe I'm like maybe this is too cynical or me like doing too much mind reading, but like I almost. I almost wonder if it's because this thought occurred to me. I'm like, is this a way of like, okay, so like if somebody doesn't take, if I offer you my chicken and I'm a homeless person, right, and you don't take a bite, like what would be the most aggro thing to respond to that would be like, what, you think you're better than me? You think you're cleaner than me? You think I'm dirty? Right? That's what you would say, offended that they didn't take your chicken. Right, and and she didn't say anything like that. She was perfectly pleasant and accepted that answer and walked away. I'm just saying, like, but I wonder if that was, like, underneath it of, like, this doesn't oh. even need to be articulated. I'm going to get you to admit that you think I'm dirty, right? Like, oh, that you, I – have you seen – have you noticed that you that do think two, you're better than me? There seems sorry, to be two types. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm kind of interrupting, but no, I, th- I think you're onto something that – like I've noticed there's ma- usually an articulation of two types here that I've noticed over the years. And that's like those who won't even make eye contact with other human beings. Cause they, to me, it just seems like, so they, like they see themselves as closer to animals than human and they've lost touch with the human world. Like they won't make eye contact with another human being. And then there's the other type who still has some ego left. Like, okay, here you go. I'll tell you a story of a, a mutual artist friend of one of my friends where what, what, what my friend said of this artist guy was, you know, and he was renowned in his time and blah, blah, blah right? And had his suicide attempts to and le- lived the life of an artist, generally speaking. But what, what my friend said of him was that he was the kind of guy where he could be dirty, homeless, you know, down and out on the side of the road with one shoe and nothing to live for. And he would still look down on you. <laughs> right so so there's types back to types of people you know maybe about aristocrat of the spirit right there <laughs> right well okay so so back to hildred's position you know he's got his biscuit box but it's not a biscuit box what he sees is a safe and he even hears okay it's auditory visual hallucinations because he hears um the safe clicking too right and the timer on the safe to close it. And he's pulling out the crown of the new American dynasty, which is his, and his cousin can't take. And what he sees is a golden diadem filled with diamonds. And he, Lewis says, what are you doing holding that old brass crown? It can't be what worth like more than a buck or two. Cause you know, he says it's valuable or something. Uh, right. Eldred does. Um, so there's all these discrepancies in there. Again, the reality of what he sees and what other people see and where they do and don't line up, I guess, is where the madness really occurs. And by madness, I mean where he goes from otherwise being just an innocuous human being walking along like everyone else, right? Because like right. the average human being is what? They're just, they're pretty innocuous. 
they're they're living like any other animal right largely like there's only so many soldiers or cops or and then from there there's only so many you know killers and predators but everyone else is in 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 between all that activity they're just being human so i don't know <laughs> it, it is funny to think i i just had this thought at the end here i'm like what if the it, it would be funny to read the story as if hildred is a completely reliable and that, in fact, he does hold a golden diadem in his hand. His evil cousin is trying to, to gaslight him into thinking that it's worthless so that he can take the crown. <laughs> um, right. And well, he succeeds then because, uh, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. the story doesn't end well. Yeah, that's the true. narrator winds up, yeah, the narrator dies in the asylum. I, I don't know. I think in the course of our conversation here, we've covered a lot of, a lot of the story with the few things we happen to obsess on or focus on. Um, you know, from the, because what mattered is the fact that you have a real political reality, you have the people living in it, and then you have their individual perceptions. And I guess my whole thing goes like, what is the line for, for like this average kind of person uh, in this book? Uh, you know, Hildred, right? He, his, um, he has a very elevated sense of himself and his reality. And it's just like, again, I can't help but think that is a reflection of the political as a whole, that it was never meant to be this thing where everyone can have an opinion and a say and a power that power always is centralized and clamped down on. And but that is the story, derangement. It's... That's the derangement of the political actually is thinking that you, if I were king, this is how I would set everything up. Right. That, and this how much me. politics is is that? It's most political discussion, honestly. Is a right, man, is right. being Hildred Castain is saying like I'm the king and this is how I would set everything up. And Right, and then you start killing people and then you can't trust anyone because of course everyone's out to get you because when you occupy I think when you occupy such a maddening and paranoid headspace you can't help but see the world as hostile and in an enemy because it's true and then maybe this similar to that mountain climber like the paranoid um you know like like a, a lenin or stalin right any of these violent men who just like murder everyone and like they can't have real friends right basically so it's like the more of a tyrant you are the less you can actually have friends and family the less and then if you can't have friends and family it goes well how far does it extend to any given culture um, how, yeah, how, how, how much can you rep replicate this cultural model before the whole model just starts falling off the abyss or into the suicide chamber? Yeah, have you seen that clip of Saddam Hussein during the bath party? Um, it's like a famous clip. Like they have a big meeting, and he's basically is reading off lists of names uh, oh, of like these David. are all the enemies of like people. Basically, he determined for whatever reason. I just need to weed these people out. And I think they, they kill like a quarter. Everyone who gets escorted out gets killed. And they killed like a quarter of the party or something like that. It was one of those purges. You know, we took power time right. to clean out anyone who's. And there's one guy where he calls out his name. And the dude's like basically begging. He's like, Saddam, we're like, you're one of my best friends. Like, Saddam, how can you do this? Uh, I forget exactly what he says. But Saddam wipes away, away a tear on camera. Like he, that guy actually was his friend, but he still reads off his name and they take him away and kill him. Um, sorry. I just thought of that when you were saying, no, no, talking about that, I was just thinking what, of that what, what other, what other th uh, better image than to illustrate the madness of the political, right? Like right there. Uh, oh, a Abraham sacrificing his kid because God told him to. <laughs> That's right. It's like, yeah. so there's two types of madness, the religious and the political. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they follow a, a similar route, like friends and family will die because um, that's kind of been history and reality. But I, I guess this idea of our kind of progressive. Yeah, or if you're Agamemnon, think, like sacrificing your daughter so that the winds are right, so you can go sack Troy, right? It goes all the way back to that. Right, right. Uh, and then that, that idea that they had something, they, they were valuable men sacrificing valuable things. Um, right. That's what was supposed to have weight, right? It, um, then that people agreed on what those values were. And so there, there it's normal. Um, yeah. You know, if we all <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all agreed. We all agreed. We, yeah, yeah, we agree it, it, that it, you it, kill the fatted calf, right? Not a, you don't kill the, the shitty calf because that would be an offense to the gods, right? You're you're right. honestly it's it's kind of potlatch, right? It's kind of it's it's kind of you know showing off your bling. It's going like we don't mm -hmm. we don't sacrifice weak cows, we sacrifice strong cows, and we can afford to do that literally because we're wealthy traders, right?
Yeah, it's the whole Cain and Abel story of God being like, I don't want your stupid fruit. I want flesh, right. baby. Oh, um, I was I was thinking of Greek ritual, but you're right. No, I think it's yeah. I think it's <laughs> similar. No, it was, but it's similar, and uh, I think in a lot they they kind of go right. It's like, hey, it's either a virgin who's pure or a warrior who's strong. Like the sacrifices are always valuable. That's what mm -hmm. matters. Um, yeah. And, and it, yeah, and then you squander it, and then you squander it, which is yes. literally it's insane behavior, <laughs> as we've already discussed. So it's like <laughs> the yeah. most valuable things in the world. Sure, let's waste it. Okay, this makes perfect sense. This right. is sanity. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, this is uh, this has been good. We've been going for like two hours, so I think we should probably yeah probably call it here. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more. I mean, we could probably talk for another two hours about the, <laughs> the king in yellow. Yeah, well, and we uh, we'll we'll definitely we we'll um. Oh, sorry. Well, what were you saying? I was just going to say, I get it. This Our literary analysis turned away from the more literal and direct. Like, I think we did it in Blind Owl because we we kind of could do it with our analysis, but we didn't have as much of, let's say, Iranian history to work off of. Uh, or, you know, it kind of became secondary to just getting into the story because that one was even dreamier and weirder in some sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah well, this no, I one, think, I think, I think, I think really this good. one too, like, yeah, I think it's a good we gave a good synopsis and and anyone who's interested like the cool thing about the king in yellow is that uh it's in the public domain so uh i think you can find it on you know the sites that publish things like public domain i don't know how kosher yes. it is to, like actually advertise that but um i'll just unrelated fact johannes gutenberg was the guy who printed the first bible so um uh yeah Go and uh, look into it. The whole collection, I think, is really good, especially the first five or six stories. And, oh, and then something else we didn't mention, like the whole idea of a text that drives you insane, the Necronomicon, that was a big, another right. thing that H.P. Lovecraft oh, picked up on. That reminds me, uh, you were mentioning the fact that Chambers did become a romance writer, and he was so successful that like he could afford a mansion off a romance writer's uh, work, which is kind of rare for any creative person, let alone a writer, but he lived at the time. But I remember Lovecraft kind of criticized him. It's like basically the equivalent of the writer selling out. I don't remember what the words Lovecraft used, but he was disappointed that he became such a hack when it came to producing um, commercialized work that would sell. Yeah, I think he said something uh, – yeah, I forget exactly how he put it. But yeah, it, it would be like – I mean, it is a weird – arc right like to be a romance writer and a weird fiction writer it'd be like if like the 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 chick who wrote uh like 50 shades of gray started writing lovecraftian horror um you know it'd be like kind of a weird turn or vice versa you know um hey, stephen you king starts writing stephen king starts writing insipid romances like you know that would be funny <laughs> um i guess he's the closest thing we have to like a yeah real I was say, yeah, yeah he doesn't he doesn't have to because he's he's so prolific otherwise um, he just did it with horror stories. Um, right. Well, cool. Well, uh, Mina, happy Halloween. And, yeah, uh, happy Halloween to you. Thanks for having thanks for me. Joining happy me. Halloween. Yeah. You got any shout outs at the end? I do, actually, um, including some projects I'm working on, namely uh, my, new, my YouTube channel, which you know, I'll send you the links for, uh, my other YouTube channel, um, in, which includes a new project I started, and that's that I'm actually working on writing The Real King in Yellow. Uh, it's a oh, story cool. in epic poetry, yeah. And I don't know what I'll name it yet, but I just wanted to plug that I'm writing The Real King in Yellow as well as I also just want to plug the channel. So Sharper Pen Image Consulting, have a lot of um, literary analysis and those kinds of things, and come and check it out if you like. Awesome. All right, signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.